Welcome. This presentation aims to highlight a main philosophical implication of quantum physics and relativity. Does quantum non-locality matter for the question of the existence of God? I think yes. To explain why, I would like to refer to the analysis of the philosopher Immanuel Kant in his Critique of Pure Reason. In this work, Kant develops a strong objection against the proofs of the existence of God, the immortality of the soul and the free will. Kant's argument is simple. Kant concludes, God cannot be proved by any causal chain consisting of corporal visible links. Kant takes into account only causal chains in space and time. His objection rests on the assumption that visible effects originate always from visible causes. The classical proofs of the existence of God include the following argument. The classical proofs of the existence of God are based on the argument that the chain of causes of the corporal phenomena cannot go to infinity. However, Kant's objection shows that the argument with the infinite chain doesn't work unless one accepts the corporal visible phenomena can be caused by spiritual causes. But if one accepts this, then the causal chain can have at most two links. Either the spiritual cause is God himself, or it is a spiritual cause created directly by God. Thus, the argument with the infinite chain of causes is tricky, because it can easily be understood in the sense of a chain of corporal causes in time, and in fact, it is often interpreted this way. But with such a causal chain, one can only reach visible corporal things, and therefore one cannot prove God. The argument with the infinite chain is, uh, so to speak, like the Achilles heel of the causal proof of God's existence. In this hill, the causal proof was shot down with the arrow of Kant's objection. Therefore, in a proof of the existence of God, it may be profitable to avoid the argument with the infinite chain of causes and substitute or at least complete it by stressing that there are visible corporal effects that come from outside the space and time, either originate from invisible non-material causes. After having objected to the causal and ontological proofs of the existence of God, Kant develops his own proof of the immortality of the soul and God's existence in his second critique, the critique of practical reason. 
It is what Kant calls the moral proof of the existence of God. Kant's moral proof of the existence of God looks as follows. Kant concludes it is morally necessary to accept the existence of God. Es ist moralisch notwendig, das Dasein Gottes anzunehmen. With his moral proof of the existence of God, Kant clearly claims to advance an argument leading to the acceptance of the existence of God, and the basis of his argument is the possibility of morality and therefore of free will. But, on the other hand, in the critique of pure reason, Kant questions that we can perform free actions in the corporal world we live. Kant claims. This means my freedom has nothing to do with the dynamic of my brain and consequently neither with the movements of my body. Therefore, the moral necessity of the existence of God through the practical reason has, ironically, no practical relevance after all. In other words, Kant denies the possibility that free will rolls corporal movements because of his assumption that visible effects cannot originate from invisible spiritual causes. Hence, Kant's objection to the causal proofs of the existence of God turns into an objection to the possibility of free will and therefore demolishes Kant's own moral proof of the existence of God. Kant became later aware of this oddity and in the Critique of Judgment wrote about the limitation of the validity of the moral proof, die Beschränkung der Gültigkeit des moralischen Beweises. He states, In this important, often overlooked text, Kant acknowledges that to prove the existence of God as the moral author of the universe, it would be necessary to combine the laws of physics with the moral postulates. In other words, Kant seems to dream that free will may become not only a moral axiom, but a physical one. For then, God can be proved to be not only the ultimate cause of the universe, but also the supreme good source of morality. In view of our analysis in the lectures 1 to 3, on quantum physics and relativity, we can conclude that Kant's dream becomes reality within today's science. Quantum experiments show that there are effects coming from outside time and space. Even the space-time comes from outside time and space. The visible world comes into existence from the invisible. Freedom is an axiom of today's science.
the experiments demonstrating quantum physics and relativity invalidate Kant's objection in his critique of pure reason, and thereby these experiments revive and strengthen the causal proofs of God's existence and Kant's moral proof as well. In this context, it is not worthy that in order to deny God's existence, Richard Dawkins feels the necessity of denying the possibility of agency from outside time and space. Richard Dawkins correctly estimates that influences from outside time and space point to God as their ultimate cause and rejects them, assuming incorrectly that there is no scientific evidence of such influences. Quantum physics and relativity invalidate Kant's objection against the proofs of the existence of God. This seems to be an interesting and far-reaching philosophical implication. Kant's dream becomes reality. Freedom and morality are not at odds with the laws of nature. Thomas Aquinas' causal proof and Immanuel Kant's moral proof are strengthened. The world is receiving its being incessantly from God, who is the personal moral author of the world. Thank you very much for your attention.